In podcast number 10, we're going to deal with independent assortment. An independent assortment is the uh, law from Mendel that's used in a two-factor cross. A two-factor cross is also known as a die hybrid. If you look over here, that prefix die just means two. So what the heck is an independent assortment? Well, here's your definition right here in this color. Alleles for different traits will segregate independently of each other. Now, what does that mean in plain English? That means you got to FOIL it, just like you learned in your math class. And remember, FOIL is an acronym. You take the first, the outside pair, the inside pair, and the last pair. All right? That's just how it works. Each gamete will get one allele for each trait. All right, so what does all this stuff mean? Here we got a picture to explain it to you. All right. In this case, let's go back to our black. In this case, we have an individual that is heterozygous for the first trait, and they are also heterozygous for the second trait. So the genotype for this one would be big A, small a, big B, little b. Now, if you went through meiosis, you're going to get four different gametes. Because remember in meiosis, one makes four. I'm going to use a different color for this one. All right, so in foil, you take the first of each pair. Big A, big B, the first of each pair. All right, and then you take the outside pair. Big A, little b, and then you take the inside pair. Now, this is the only time that we put the little letter in front of the big letter because we're dealing with A's first, B's second. Normally, we put the dominant letter in front. Okay, I just want to let you remember that that's a B. Now, finally, we take the last of each pair, little a, little b. And that same thing's going over here in this graphic. But remember, first, outside, inside, last. Now, why are we doing all this stuff? Because when we do this independent assortment, all these guys over here, these represent gametes reproductive cells. And gametes, they go on the outside of a Punnett square. Let me get caught up here. That's a square, Punnett square. Get it? If you can get the gametes or the letters on the outside of a Punnett square correctly, you can fill out a Punnett square perfectly every time. All right, so let's show you a dihybrid cross in action. Mendel used the same type of terminology when he did his monohybrid crosses as he did in his dihybrid crosses. So you need to remember stuff like first parental generation, first set of offspring, the F1, second set, F2. All right, the P2s were heterozygous for both traits. Let me get you caught up here because on this PowerPoint slide, I took a little shortcuts. So for Mendel, the P1s would have been um, purebred for both traits. They could have been this, and then obviously the other parent would be the opposites. All right? Purebred for the A trait, purebred for the B trait, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And basically, your F. Oops, let's make that a one. Your F ones. This parent can only give a big A, and this parent can only give a little A. This parent can only give little Bs. And this parent can only give big Bs. So all of the offspring would be heterozygous for both traits. And you got to remember, the F1s will become the P2s. So as you can see up here, the P2s are all heterozygous for both traits. This is how it happened. I took a little shortcut on this slide just because I was lazy. All right, But P1s, purebred for both traits. F1s, hybrid for both traits. Now, when you cross your P2s, you get to be heterozygous, or I'm sorry, the P2s are heterozygous for both traits. If both parents are that way, the phenotype ratio is always 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. 9 are dominant phenotype for both. Three of them are dominant for the first, recessive for the second. Another three are the complete opposite, recessive phenotype for the first, dominant for the second. And one of the boxes will be recessive for both. And if you do your math, that's 16 boxes. All right, I'm going to go back here one step. 
All right. Remember there was three ratios you need to memorize and what situations cause them. Three to one and one to two to one. Those are both in a monohybrid situation. The other famous one is this guy right here. Nine to three to three to one. This occurs in a dihybrid cross when both parents are heterozygous for both traits. All right, let's pop a picture in here, show you what's going on. All right, in this case, we have uh, peas, and we've got the rough and the smooth. And you see these speckled ones down here, these are the rough, all right? So remember, smooth is dominant over rough, which is a little r, and then yellow is dominant over green. Let's write this off to the side because some of you may not remember what I just said. Okay, that's a smooth, that's a rough or dented. These are all in like podcast number two, three, or something like that. Uh, big Y is a yellow P, and then a little Y is green. All right, so if you would foil these parents, first of each pair, the outside pair, the inside pair, and the last of each pair. And since the other parent had the exact same genotype, first of each uh, first of each pair, the outside pair, the inside pair, the last of each pair. And now it's just plug and chug. Big R, big R, big Y, big Y. Big R, big R, big Y, little Y, so on and so forth. All right, remember that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio? All right. How many of them are going to be dominant for both traits? Which means they're going to have at least one big R and they're going to have at least one big Y. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, how many of them are going to be dominant for the first trait and recessive for the second trait? You need just one big R for dominant, but in order to be recessive for the second trait, you need to have two little letters. So in other words, how many of them are going to be smooth and green? One, two, three. All right, how many of them are going to be just the opposite? They're going to be rough, but they're going to be yellow. And to be yellow, you only need at least one. You just need one big Y. If you have two, doesn't matter. You're still going to look the same. Okay, rough and yellow. One, two, three. All right, how many of them are going to be recessive for both traits? To be recessive for the coke uh, texture, you got to have two little R's. And the only way that you can be green is you can be two little Y's. And you'll notice it's just that guy left there. And that's how you get your nine to three to three to one ratio. Now, if you were to do a genotype ratio, it'd be all jacked up. Like that one, let's go see get a different color in here. The only one that's uh, homozygous for both traits is that guy. And how many of them have two big R's and heterozygous for the second? Boom, boom, two. All right, how many of them are heterozygous for the first trait, homozygous, dominant for the second one? Boom, boom, one. Okay, how many of them are homozygous, dominant for the first, recessive for the second? Only that guy. All right, how many of them are heterozygous for every trait for both traits? One, two, three, four. All right, how many of them are heterozygous for the first trait, homozygous recessive for the second? Right though, those two guys. All right, how many of them are homozygous recessive for the first trait, homozygous dominant for the second trait? That guy. All right, now I got to go down the other side. Get rid of that one. All right, how many of them are homozygous dominant? I'm sorry, homozygous recessive for the first trait, heterozygous for the second. One, two. And then how many of them are homozygous recessive for both traits? One. So the genotype ratio for this one would always be one to two to one to one to four to two to one to two to one. And that's the last time we ever try to do that. Who cares about all that stuff? This one's much simpler. So whenever we, usually when we do these 16 uh, box Punnett squares, we just look at a phenotype ratio most of the time. Sometimes we do this, but in this situation, we never ask for that. It's just too complicated. All right, let's do a different one over here, another two-factor cross. All right, let's have an individual 
that is heterozygous for both traits, but it's going to mate with an individual that's purebred for both. Right? So if you do the foil, the gametes for this first parent will come out like this. And over here, if you foil it, you're going to get only two different kinds. They're going to be this, they're going to be that. And if you would foil it, you know, the first of each pair, the outside pair, the inside pair would be the same, the last of each pair. Now, how many different gametes do we got here? Well, we've, we're going to put this individual on the top. So we know we got four there. We could do all 16 boxes, but that's really not necessary. We're only going to do this one because remember that one's the same. So we only need four boxes. So we're going to use a shortcut because laziness is the foundation of efficiency. And now it's just plug and chug. Big A, big A, little B, little B, big A, little B. So that one's heterozygous. All right, what's the genotype ratio here? How many of them have a genotype like that? Well, only that guy. All right, one. How many of them are like that? One. How many are like this? You guessed it, one. How many are like that? One. So the genotype ratio is one to one to one to one. All right, the phenotype ratio, how many of them are going to be dominant for both traits? That means you got to have at least one big A, one big B. One. Two. How many are going to be dominant for the first, recessive for the second? One, two. Now, that one will reduce to one to one. So the phenotype ratio can often be different than a genotype ratio. And that's how you do a two-factor cross with independent assortment.